I just started the recording. Oh, perfect. All right. Well then, yeah, let's uh, let's dive in. So welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Yoko. I'm here uh, on behalf of Yoko CEO, and I'm sitting here with Heinan. We'll get into some intros in just a moment. We're going to be talking about the thing all of us are doing now, which is you know working remotely and the impact it plays in company culture. And We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But one of the things I want to do before we jump in is just make sure everyone's aware of how to ask questions and uh, how we're going to kind of jump in on things. So up here, you'll see we've got uh, the, if you're new to Zoom, which it seems like we live in these days, uh, but if you are new to Zoom, there's a chat option right there uh, in your uh, Zoom window towards the, the bottom bar. And if you just want to jump in, you can either you know send a message to all panelists, or if you have something that you want to have voiced, uh, you can send it specifically to Lauren or Julia, and they'll voice it for Hanan and I to answer. And this is meant to be really conversational. It's not going to be a formal presentation uh, of you know X, Y, and Z, and we're not going to be reading PowerPoints aloud. It's going to be very conversational, and we want you to be a part of a con the conversation. So while we can't have everyone unmuted and video and everything popping up because it's a little too chaotic, we tried that. It didn't work well. Uh, we're going to do it this way, and so we do want everyone to feel uh, involved. So don't feel like you have to hold your question if you've got something that you feel like uh, is either thematically appropriate or just a fun question to ask. Feel free to throw it in chat, and we'll get you an answer. Um, beyond that, let me go ahead and jump into uh, some quick introductions. So <clears throat> for those of you that don't know me, as I said, uh, my name is Chris Yoko. Uh, I'm with Yoko CO, yokoco.com. And we are a web presence management firm and we work exclusively with organizations that have the way we phrase it is a passion or purpose beyond just profit. We understand profit moves the economy, moves the, uh, the organizations forward. But if that's where things begin and end for you, you tend not to be our type of people. We want to think about working with organizations that have a goal to transform and have a positive impact on the world. And obviously, critical business metrics are a part of that. And uh, we help them do that by, we say, pulling the longest lever that's available to them, which is their web presence. Let you have a lot of access uh, to a lot of people very quickly with uh, you know fairly minimal cost. Um, and as you can see, I've also used PowerPoint. So I think that's one of my big accolades. And then I'm super excited to, to uh, introduce our guest today. So we've got Hainan Landa with us. Um, he is the founder and CEO of Optimal Networks, which is an amazing IT firm. Uh, he also is the very recent author of The Modern Law Firm, and you'll regularly see him on TV, radio, online outlets all over the place talking about latest trends, latest trends in technology and how you can apply them either personally or more often in business. And so uh, with that being said, uh, Hainan and I, yeah, Hainan. I, I also used PowerPoint once. You did? I, just, I, I didn't I, see that on your LinkedIn. You'll have to add that in. Sorry, I'll, I'll amend it. <laughs> there we go. Get that in there. And um, yeah, today we're just going to be talking about the, you know, interesting, I think, juxtaposition and the interesting um, ways that technology play with, you know, the way that we're working remotely and the impact that has on company culture. Um, so as we get into it, hang on, first off, is there anything I missed in terms of the intro or anything you feel like is pertinent to today's conversation to make sure everyone knows? Um. Probably, but I say let's just get into it, and then if, that, <laughs> if it like pops into my head, we'll uh, we'll go there. <laughs> we'll backtrack. We'll fix it in post. We'll fix backtrack. It. Yeah, we'll fix it in post. <laughs> Absolutely. Cool. Well, um, I think it's been interesting. I mean, so for those of you that don't know, uh, my organization, uh, we've worked remotely, kind of since our inception. And Hanan, I know you guys have had a very kind of flexible policy, and you've seen a lot of the evolution. How have you seen things evolve over the course of just while you've been, you know? working in terms of optimal networks, both for yourselves and for, for clients? Well, you know, actually, shoot, we I go back three decades. So I'm, I'll trace this very quickly for you. Uh, so you can see some of the changes that, that have happened. Um, when we started out helping companies with their networks, with their information systems, um, all we did was send an engineer on site on some sort of a regular schedule. That's all we did. There, <laughs> There was no remote, <laughs> right? Right. There was no was remote. People were not worried. This was very hands-on, very tactical. Um, you know, we had an office. We answered the phone, uh, but we didn't even take tech support calls. Like there was no, the, the idea of a help desk hadn't even really been invented yet, to be very honest, and um, at least not on the PC side. And we were just out there sending, sending engineers, and so 
we amassed like a stable of engineers. I think at one point we probably had, I don't know, 12, 15 engineers who all they did was go on site. And it triggered a huge question for us, which was, how do you keep people who are on site all the time and not at your office, right? You got a distributed workforce. How do you keep them connected? Right. So this was the first, yeah. this is like the first seed of, uh, there's got to be a way to do it. Right. And, and you didn't I, have the advantage of any of the platforms we have now at that time. Yeah. Nothing. There's no video, you know, cell phones were coming out. Um, and interestingly enough, I see if you remember this and I hope that none of our viewing audience remembers this. Nextel had a push button, push to talk phone. <laughs> Right? Uh, I remember those, yeah. <laughs> and you could whip the phone off your belt buckle and just immediately, it was almost like an instantaneous walkie-talkie to anyone in your organization. And that actually helped. It helped a lot, you know, because you didn't have to dial. And for some reason, it made you feel a little bit more connected. So we were, we were struggling with this idea of how to connect a distributed workforce from the get-go. Then like in the year 2000, like between 2000 and 2005, this whole idea of managed services came out. And we learned that there were, you know, people started introducing all these tools to be able to um, like connect to your computers remotely and monitor and manage your computer right. remotely. So we began to be able to do more remotely. And so we did build a help desk. And then shortly thereafter, I'm trying to remember exactly when this was, uh, maybe not that shortly. Maybe it was like just like six or seven years ago. <laughs> um, the it was becoming very difficult to hire help desk people here in D.C. because the economy was booming and the government was sucking them up like crazy. Oh right. So we said, hey, look, we got to serve our clients. What would happen if we broadened our geography a little bit, right? And right, right. what would happen if we hired someone, say, in Pittsburgh? Well, we hired someone in Pittsburgh. We ended up hiring a whole team of people in Pittsburgh. And, um, and it became quite a challenge to see if we, how we could connect them remotely and how we, could, um, how we could really bring them into the company culture and make them feel connected. Right. Um, and we totally screwed it up. <laughs> <laughs> the, the first option of learning is, you know, you make a bunch of yeah. mistakes. Yeah, so that's, I don't know. Um, so we screwed it up. We had people leave us, you know, people, they'd get another job offer and they weren't really connected to us and they just pick up and leave. And we were like, oh my God. And, you know, there's part of you is like, well, look, this is an entry level position. It's low paid. Of course, they're going to go somewhere else. But the truth is people want to be connected. And yeah. once we started figuring it out, and I, I mean, I, I know we're going to talk a lot more about some of the tools and tips and stuff that you guys do. Um, we got really good at working remotely and we even managed to connect those engineers in better. Um, and, you know, we met, we found ways to get our culture out there. If you, look back at, if you look back at that time, because so many people right now they're this is like their first foray in having people remote, right? So all the stuff that you went through when you were just hiring people in Pittsburgh, some people are going through right now and they're like, oh yeah. no, we're messing it up. So if there's like a couple things you look back and you're like, well, we messed this up and we messed that up. Like what are some of those mistakes made so maybe other people can avoid them or if they're in the middle of making them, maybe slam the brakes. Sure. Well, hopefully not. I can give you two mistakes. Sure. Two, two quick right off the bat mistakes. The first is we gave zero attention to getting our culture out there. We said, you know what? We're gonna have these people in at the beginning. They're gonna, we're gonna, because it was Pittsburgh, it's not like it's, you know, Alaska. We're gonna right. bring them, or Antarctica would have been a better word, um, <laughs> a better place. You know, we'll, we'll bring them into our office for a couple of weeks when they start. We'll onboard them. We'll teach them all about our culture. We'll bring them into our kitchen. You know, we'll, teach, right. we'll, we'll have coffee with them and everything else. And then we'll send them back and they'll be fine. And they're forever changed. We're and that's it. They, they have been exposed to the optimal, you know, the, the gods of They've culture. They've been optimized. Been optimized. Absolutely. Been optimized. <laughs> so, yeah, so that doesn't work. So the, the, what, what does work is a very methodical intent to make sure that people are connected to your culture at all times, whatever that culture 
is. And I'll, we can talk about some of the things we ended up doing after that to really do it much more methodically and, and make sure that they were connected in. But just this idea of, hey, you can work remotely, you got access to the data, you got access to a phone, we've connected you in technologically, right? But we gave no thought to the actual culture and it just right. that didn't work. Um, so I guess my first comment would be, you gotta be intentional about it. The second thing is we tried to put in place some, um, some tools, some tech tools, uh, one of them being Yammer. If you recall. Oh yeah, I remember Yammer. Yeah, that was Microsoft's attempt at uh, Facebook for business. Yep. And, um, and we said, hey, we're all sort of semi-technical, more technical, less technical. We'll just sort of give everyone a license for Yammer and everyone can just sort of set it up and I'm sure it'll work great. <laughs> <laughs> it'll solve itself, I'm sure. Yeah, <laughs> so that was a, an epic fail. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, that's, that's not a way to organize communications inside of a, of a company. And that we sort of learned that the hard way and we had to go back and retrench so that when we did end up picking Slack and, and love it, but to put it in, we did an analysis to make sure it was the right tool. And then we must have spent three months putting it in correctly and figuring out, figuring out how optimal needs to use Slack. Right. What are our ways of using it? What sort of channels do we need? You know, the simplest example is we're big food people, right? So we have, we have the kitchen here. I mean, I'm in my, did I mention I was in my office today for the first time in a month? month oh, and really? Half? Yeah, I was, I was totally going to do this from my house, but it was taken over by children. Um, <laughs> I had the same issue. <laughs> so I said, you know what? There's no one else here. It's safe. I have gloves, masks. I'll be here. You but know. we have a kitchen, which we just redid. We just doubled in size. It's, it's, it's our pride and joy. We love sitting there. We love having our Friday morning breakfast. We love having food there. We love introducing people there. Um, you know, and, and it's a big thing for us. So that's our physical kitchen. So we in Slack made a kitchen channel and that was, has much more meaning to our organization as a place to sort of fool around, have fun, right. let your hair down, you know, then calling it the traditional water cooler channel. First, we don't have a water. I mean, we do have a water cooler, but it's just part of our kitchen, just like everything else. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I think that's one of the things that's, also kind of interesting about what's happening right now is so many people are one, it, it, like I thought Slack was fairly ubiquitous at this point. Like I was like, all right, everyone who needs it. And now I'm hearing a lot of people starting to adopt it. And what's interesting is, so you talked about culture being done really intentionally. Mm -hmm. So there's one thing where, yeah, if you don't do it intentionally, it's going to happen by accident. Right. Either way, culture is happening. True. But even now, if you were really intentional about your culture and it had so many in-person elements to it or just requirements for people to be in close contact. <clears throat> what I think has been interesting to see is there are some organizations that have been, okay, great. We're just going to emulate that stuff online. Mm -hmm. And I think they've seen where that fails, where it's just like, okay, cool. We're just going to give people like we used to have X and now we'll turn on this new tool and I'm sure it'll be fine. Cause it'll be, you know, at that point you could jump on the intercom or walk into anyone's office. So this is kind of like that. And it's a totally different set of rules and people just aren't thinking about it. And it can like, be causing like mandatory, you mean like mandatory zoom virtual lunches? Things like that. Yeah. Where I think most people, you know, there was a time even early in this where, and we used to do this for like our holiday parties and stuff where we'll do like a zoom holiday party or a zoom happy hour. And they're fun every once in a while. But if you spent, eight hours in Zoom, and then it's like, cool, we're going to do another thing in Zoom. It loses its luster a little bit. You've got to think about ways to change it up and be creative to keep you know, it exciting. And what I think is also becoming true is, and I think everyone kind of sees this happen different ways for their teams, is different softwares have just like a different mindset around them. So it's like, okay, cool. If I'm in this this is like a work platform and I kind of have the work part of my brain activated and going. Mm. So even changing things up from, you know, okay, I'm on a zoom to, Oh, I'm going to FaceTime somebody real quick and FaceTime seems fun and casual where it's the exact same thing happening basically, but because it's a different app, it feels like a different space and I have the right to be a little bit different. I, I want to go back to something you just said right before that. It's, all, it's a very good point. This idea sure. that 
some apps are sort of less work related. Like yeah, I feel the same way about FaceTime and WhatsApp and Messenger. If I'm playing in those, it's, uh, you know, my friends and stuff and, and my family. And then if I go to Slack, it's work. But, <laughs> but what you said a moment ago, I thought was something that we've, we just started figuring out too, even now, which is that you got to have some variety with it. Right. Right. Like this idea of, Hey, every Tuesday morning, we're, or every Tuesday at lunch, we're going to have a mandatory lunch and everyone's going to be on it and you're going to eat with each other. <laughs> you're going to like it. <laughs> and you're going to like it. Yeah. So, so it's very interesting because here's, here's what we did when this whole thing first started. So we had, we had probably, I don't know, 50 to 60% of our organization is used to being remote and used to being at home. And a lot of the rest of us are not, we're just not. And right. like we can work from home. We didn't have any problem with the technology. That was a uh, that was easy. Um, and we know how to do all this. Yes, <laughs> you got, you're a tech company. You should know something, right? <laughs> <laughs> but but to sit our butts down for eight, ten, twelve hours a day in front of a screen that's a different that's a different skill set for sure. You know, day after day after day after day. So after that first week, we organized a quick company happy hour. And it was very well attended. We figured out a way to play music via Zoom and everyone was drinking their beers and stuff. And it was very sort of energizing, especially to those of us who are extroverts and neat right. people and all that. Okay, so we did that. Then, and it was great. Then the next week we did it again and a few less people showed up to it. And the third week I started getting like, wait, what are you gonna do this every week? <laughs> <laughs> Like, I was going to until you said that. <laughs> you said something. And so, and so then we skipped it. And then we said, all right, let's try something different. And we tried because we do our Friday morning breakfasts where we cook food and, and eggs and pancakes. And maybe one day we'll be able to invite you again because <laughs> you'll enjoy it. Um, but, um, you know, so we said, all right, let's do a virtual breakfast. Whole different set of people showed up at 9 a.m. on a Friday morning. Right. Worked great for the first week, worked great for the second week. Third week, I already got, I got the message. We're not having <laughs> it. I, I know, we're not having it. So then somewhere around week six, I don't know if you, I, I have to share this because it was hilarious, is <laughs> there is a service put out by an animal sanctuary, which is basically a, a farm that tries to save animals from the slaughter, called Goat to Meeting. <laughs> probably the most hilarious thing we'd ever done so we put together a a virtual happy hour on friday night in like like the sixth weekend and it was packed and as a surprise visitor we had 15 minutes worth of some lady out in north dakota running around after all these animals <laughs> <laughs> I swear one of them has a presentation to give. Let me just get them over here. Yeah, pretty much. We got some of those too. They were uh, hilarious. Nice. <laughs> yeah. That's fantastic. But you know, you do have to keep changing it and livening it up and, and adjusting and shifting because I don't think there's one answer to this. How yeah, I mean, you've got to read the room, right? Like I'm in a certain point, like I think a lot of people are like, look, there's so much going on. That, like, we just want to kind of check this off and be like, cool, we're doing the happy hours. That problem is solved. We can move on to the next one. Yeah. And like you said, like, that's cool for a week or two, but then you need to be able to change it up and maybe do something different. And I think that's going to be different for different, you know, teams. It's going to do like, you guys like the great. breakfast. So it's like, that's great. I tried to do breakfast with our team. Like the majority of us are either West coast or late risers. So like, <laughs> you know, like it'd just be an empty zoom room with like probably Ray and maybe one or two other people. And that would be that. Uh, but it's about, yeah. Adapting to what people want or need and not being afraid to experiment too. Like just try something out. It's not, you don't have a lot of overhead with this stuff, right? Like you can just go try it out. Whereas before you'd be like, I don't know. That's like, we got the catering cost and the venue and da da da. here. It's like, Hey guys, I'm going to do this. Like if you want to join, here's the link and right. let's have at it. I, I think that's very, very true. <laughs> Cost, costs are through the floor right now. Right. Right. So I think there's a lot of options in terms of just trying that stuff out. And then if we do think about the people that, you know, we're, 
well into this thing and there's the hope that, oh, we're going to be opening soon and we'll have some more flexibility, but like it's going to be this way until we've got a better read on what's going on with the virus at some capacity. Like sure, some people might come back in, some people aren't going to feel comfortable. Um, and we've reached, you know, that early point, it was, you know, the brain loves novelty. So it's like, oh, like this is new and different. And so it's not fun per se because it's under a crisis but it's different enough it keeps it interesting and mm -hmm. i'm gonna put the nose to the grindstone and do my thing and then that starts to wear off and you start to be like okay so this is just how it's going to be and like you said i'm just supposed to sit and stare at a screen for eight hours 10 hours 12 hours whatever this amount of time is and i'm not able to go out and see anybody and it starts to become really despondent and so you see this thing where a lot of people are like oh i think our culture is adapting pretty well because people are like oh this is new and it's meant to be temporary and now it's not feeling so temporary and it's compounded by all the other things that are going on and it becomes really important to be mindful of culture in general and checking in on people and I think empowering if you don't already have that kind of relationship with your team members the ability for people to connect as peers and check in with each other because you can't do everything you know centered on one person um, but it's also I think more important than ever for the people that are starting to use a bunch of these tools, if you're using mm -hmm. them for the first time, you have that same, you know, kind of wave. Oh, this is novel. This is neat. Ha ha ha. Right. And then that curve tends to hit a little bit quicker. Um, you know, you mentioned it with Yammer. We had the same thing with Slack where, you know, whenever we first deployed it, it was like, ha ha, this is cool. Oh, by default, it notifies me of every comment happening across everything. And so yeah. suddenly it's like, great. My email volume went down a ton, which is awesome. But now, every 48 seconds, I get a little like ding, 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 ding. And I've never been able to concentrate on anything. So then we went back and started to revise like, who gets notification? What's the expectation? Like, what are the roles? Right. So I'll hear a little bit about, since you guys did it so intentionally, kind of what you learned as you mapped through that. And then maybe for, you know, the folks watching, we can talk a little bit about how to structure tools like these or how to approach it. If it's something we've already kind of thrown it in and you see some you know, maybe behavior you're not a huge fan of. Uh, and then some other things you can add on to it. You know, each of them are, or Slack's, you know, a great platform. There's a lot of add-on tools and stuff you can use. And I'd love to hear what some of your favorites are and I'm happy to share some of mine. Oh, sure. So um, I think for us, the biggest, because we were coming from a culture that did not have that kind of, um, those kind of channels and those sorts of, the way to interact with threads and, and things like that. We did actually have instant messaging. We had a separate instant messaging platform. So we were very used to uh, pinging each other quickly. That was not a problem. And that's actually a very easy part of Slack to deploy and, and Teams as well. And what we've in general been recommending during this particular crisis is go ahead and deploy Slack, go ahead and deploy Teams, but stick to the, the direct messages and maybe a channel for announcements and a channel for people to have fun. And then back off a little bit and let's really figure out how to really use it for your, um, for your organization. So for example, um, we really needed a place to be able to converse about every single client. Right. And so we did a uh, integration link with our CRM so that when we have a client, it automatically creates a Slack channel and it automatically puts the right people, the client team into that Slack channel. Nice. So um, every one of our clients, all the stuff that goes on about them, all the back chatter, right? All right. the stuff that was taking millions of emails going back and forth. Should we recommend this? Should we recommend that? You know, but this laptop's big, but this laptop's too small and it's not fast enough and what have you. <laughs> all this stuff goes into those client channels. We strongly encourage threads. So if someone posts a question or a post, you don't just reply to it like direct messages. Right. Because Everyone can see it. Yeah. Yeah. Because then your Slack channel just explodes. So we're like, use threads, use threads, use threads. It actually took some time to teach people to use. Man, it's like threads. muscle memory. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. Um, what else did we do? We, when someone was talking in the wrong channel, uh, we came up with an icon called, a, which was a, a emoji of a boot. <laughs> <laughs> Boot you out of this channel, go use the right channel. Right. <laughs> so it was just a very polite and well understood way of gently telling people, go go use the right channel for this. You know, these are things that would seem intuitive, but they're they're really not. I mean, it's really a learning curve. We we set up training. We did um we did an hour's worth of Slack training for every single person in the organization. Good deal. 
and uh, remedial slack training for certain people <laughs> who will remain nameless. <laughs> and um, you know, I'm trying to think what else. We did not do a ton of integrations. We did integrations with our own CRM. We integrated with Zoom. Um, all of our, Bob asked a question. He says, yeah. how much of our training is uh, video based? And we did at that time, which was, um, you know, still we were all allowed to run around and talk to people. We still did all of our training uh, on Zoom for Slack on Zoom because it's really, it's really easy to do training on a computer platform where you can share the screen and record it for for new people coming in. So we did that. We we captured the video training and we put it into our onboarding procedures. Um, Trying to think of what else. We had a document we put together called Rules of the Road that really sort of talked about Slack etiquette. I'll tell you one of the most interesting things that we did was we put together a pilot group. We snatched someone from every single part of the organization and we put them in a pilot group. We said, all right, you're going to start using Slack a little bit and tell us what you think. We're going to have two follow-up calls, which were big Zoom calls because people right. were all over the place. And... Um, and they were really helpful. They were really super helpful. In fact, um, the, the fa my favorite thing that came out of the pilot was that someone very sort of tentatively and politely said, you know, in our previous instant messaging program, we could like use all these little GIFs and emojis and <laughs> you know, it really let us sort of express our emotions when we were connecting with people. And Slack doesn't seem to have that. It feels very dry. Before they had finished saying the sentence, the engineer who was in charge of deploying Slack, you know, <laughs> integrated some GIF keyboard or something and everyone was like, oh, this is awesome. There it is. <laughs> there it is. I think we've integrated Bitmoji and, and Zoom and we're playing with different project management tools that integrate with Slack like Trello and Asana. Yeah. And Jira. Um, you know, I don't know that we've necessarily settled on one, but those, those sorts of things. Yeah. I mean, a lot of it from what we've seen around the, you know, Slack side is definitely, it's kind of like the culture thing, right? If you don't do it intentionally, it's going to happen by accident. And so you'll start to have people running wild and setting notifications differently. We didn't notice, like, I want to say pretty much no, no one, especially on the leadership team knew like what a burden it was for some people to be like, you know, I'm trying to do like some deep development work and then it's like ping, 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 ping. And I want to be available to answer questions, but I also like, I'm trying to do like deep work that I need to kind of be in flow right. for. And so we're like, well then just like turn off notifications. Like do we, right. do we need to do so that we had to like make sure we gave everyone permission. Like, Hey, yeah. lock time off on your calendar, turn off. Like all we want you to really do is, you know, Slack is meant to be asynchronous. Mm hmm and synchronous if you're both there. If you're both there and you can chat, like that's great. That's happy happenstance. For the most part, as long as you just check in at the end of the day and you're like, hey, yeah, like I can get that to you tomorrow, boom, boom, boom. And we know where things are at, everyone's gonna feel good. And then- um, And every organization has to set up their own cadence with this. Yeah, for sure. You know, um, and, and so we also have clients using Teams. I know Bob is on the, on this, on the webinar, so he's, he is a, a big Teams user. And it's interesting to hear the two uh, compared. Teams, teams for people who have never had anything like this is terrific and it can be set up really, really well, mm -hmm. which is very nice. And for people who are used to Slack, Teams hurts. It does. We have a couple of <laughs> clients where we're part of their like, you know, Teams infrastructure and it's like, oh, all right, we put the training wheels back on. So right, we can't right. really <laughs> lean into the curve as much, but yeah. they do. Like, yeah. But um, yeah, and then for us, I mean, it's also a thing where Slack, especially depending on the size of your organization, it can move so quickly in terms of conversation. Like you said, like if you're not threading things or even if you have a lot of people contributing to a thread, you can miss right. a lot like that. Yeah. And so one of the rules we had to set up is, you know, if I ask you to do something in Slack and you miss it or you don't get around to it, it's on me. Mm. If I assign you something in Asana, it's on you. So mm. like Asana is the place where work gets assigned and you can ask somebody just like if you were passing by their office and you're like, hey, can you give me that report? Like, Sure. Like that's a nice way and all things being equal, like they want to remember, but if they had eight other people stop by their office and ask them for things like, yeah, they might've forgotten you need to put it in a more reliable system. And it's those kind of things that, I mean, you'll definitely learn the hard way if you don't do the stuff initially to make it a little bit easier for yourself. But I think there's a, a couple of things that you could do to just make the adoption of it a lot easier on your team and to kind of help emulate and reinforce your culture a little bit more. Yeah, we did. We, 
So what we did was we set a rule that if a conversation starts getting too deep, uh, pick up the phone. Don't forget, it works. <laughs> yeah. Let me type a page back to you and you wait 15 <laughs> minutes to read it and respond. I, went, I was going down to some, uh, some Slack channel for some client and there was a question in there. I can't remember what it was. There were over 72 responses to this one question in the thread. I'm like, really? Yeah. Who's expecting me to read 72 responses? You guys couldn't get on the phone for five minutes and sort this out? <laughs> yeah, that's uh, I do love the ability within Slack to like link to prior messages because somebody linked to like a prior thread and it was like a hundred things deep. And I was like, can I get a summary? Like what, <laughs> bottom line this for me, like what, what did this look like? Right. And then, um, yeah, yeah, I think the, uh, the integrations with Slack are pretty great um, once you use them intentionally, but I wouldn't go you, know, you want to talk for two seconds about what Asana is and what these these different programs do? Because a lot of people yeah, look at, at, at Slack as a project management tool, and I don't view it as a project management tool. Yeah, me neither. Um, how would, so I know how I would phrase Slack, but okay. how would you kind of articulate it to somebody since that is a part of what you guys do? <laughs> um, I would, I mean, it's awful because the word collaboration is so overused. But I would really look at it as a way to communicate. Direct person to person and about a project or about a document or about your work or whatever you want to communicate. But it's really a communication tool more than anything else. Yep. Yeah, we can sort of the same. It's more of a medium. It helps. It's, you know, in the Venn diagram, it overlaps a little bit with a phone. It overlaps a little bit, a lot with email. It overlaps with heavily with like your old IM, you know, whatever platform you might've been using. Mm -hmm. um, but it's meant to, you know, facilitate mostly just communication. It's not meant to be an archive, an assignment tool or anything like that, which is when right. you start to get into what some of those other platforms are useful for. Yeah. And those, those platforms are great for creating projects, you know, coming up with the tasks underneath the project. Some of them are really good at capturing templates. So if it's yeah. a project you're doing over and over and over and over, you can create a project in Asana, put a template in for it. It'll like lay out the whole project. You can assign the different tasks for people and you can monitor status and communicate about the project in Slack or in, I, I'm sure it integrates with Teams too. I haven't checked, but right. in whatever, so whichever channel, whatever communication package you're using, you could talk about Asana. Yeah, which uh, we find is really useful because like you said, it is like, great. This is the project management software. It's built for that. And like we said, different apps tend to have different like headspaces associated with them. Yep. Same thing even with that is like, okay, great. This is where I can go check off my to-do list. Mm -hmm. I can see for different users at different levels, um, you know, we can take a look at like, okay, how, you know, much are we above or below overall capacity and goal and like all of those fun things. And, you know, obviously it goes all the way into the weeds of like task and subtask. And we find that that's a really good place for that stuff to live. Um, and those tend to be primarily internal platforms, but what I've found has been really useful for Slack uh, for clients that we work with is um, we've got a couple of clients that they've got like bigger teams and there's a lot of people that we're trying to get looped in and they can't be looped in into a meeting or something. Mm -hmm. And so we have one client we just tried this with. We did the kickoff meeting via Zoom, you know, it was 12 people or whatever, and we all get to know each other and that's great. And then every other meeting we've done since then has been asynchronous. So what we've done is I've recorded or as a member of our team has recorded like, hey guys, here's the deliverable. Here's what we're thinking about for X, Y, and Z. Here's what we'd like some feedback on. What do you think? Pop it in there. It takes what would have been a 90 minute meeting is a seven minute video everyone can watch. And if they just want to nod their head along, they go like, okay, that's great. And then you've got it all in writing. So, you know, like, okay, you guys approved this. Or yeah. there's a quick video back where they say like, oh, hey, like uh, I'd like to be able to change this and boom, boom, boom. And what we found is for the teams that are equipped or ready to do that, ooh, so much faster. Like we had anticipated a really long set of delays because we knew we were going to have to try to get all these people in a room and schedules are crazy. And this has enabled us to move at a much quicker cadence and they've been really comfortable with it. So, I mean, it's nice whenever exactly. you- that's actually brilliant. And it reminds me of, um, what, what do they call that? Flipped learning? Where they record, where the teachers record the lectures, but actually do the homework with the students in the classroom format. Oh, I'm not familiar with that. I haven't heard yeah, that. So, so the students watch their, and they were doing this before, before the, um, the pandemic, and now they're doing it more and more, where basically the teachers deliver a recording of the lecture. 
um, or of the topic and the students watch it and then they all come together in a meeting to do or in a class setting to do the actual homework because that way they can be more collaborative and they can work on specific problems with the professor and it's much like it's a better use of the of the time than for them to just sit there and listen and take notes they can do that right like that's the broadcast part of the course or yeah. the meeting or anything right like anyone can just sit and listen we don't right. have to have everyone there is you know they really the the conversational or the collaborative part that you really want to have the connective tissue around and so yeah. i think frees people up so i'm interested to try that with a few more clients and it can be for large organization, like obviously you want to set some protocol around like, hey, like maybe here's how we speak and here's a little bit about what it looks like whenever we're speaking inside the organization versus a channel that's open to the outside organization and everything so that there's some norms and stuff you wouldn't think you'd have to teach people like you still have to teach people in that capacity. But look, also, uh, some people are more comfortable with video and some people are not. I'm yeah. still I'm still seeing situations where people do not want to turn on their cameras. Um, or would or per, much 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 prefer a cell phone. Now we we internally are have been pushing uh, cameras and turn your camera on from the get go. And our approach with the clients, and so we've been using video with the clients for a, a long time. Um, and we usually do not insist that the clients use video. Mm -hmm. Uh, cause they're clients. So, you know, you can't really insist <laughs> that they do anything. Um, but you know, we respect if they would just like to go voice, but they see us in the video and then over time they get more and more comfortable with the video and they will, it might be the fifth time you have a call with them, they'll turn on the video. So yeah. now, now it's a little bit different cause everyone got this crash course on how to use zoom and how to be, how to make sure that, you know, you don't point the camera in weird directions and <laughs> take it with you into the bathroom. And <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah, yeah. we saw all the chaos that can happen when you do it wrong. Right. Um, you know, and how to get the proper lighting on your face and everything like that. And but the um, all these things, all these techniques, whether you're using specific project management software, whether you're using collaborative so communication software, whether you're doing video and then expect the, and then working through something in a response with the client. These are all phenomenal tools to use when you're working remotely. And some of them go to culture and some of them go to productivity and some of them go to management and some of them go to client communications. You know, yeah. I, I think all, can, yeah. Yeah. It certainly ties in. And what's been, I think, interesting about, the video side is so we're big proponents of video. We do the same thing. We keep video on and then eventually clients feel more comfortable turning it on. <clears throat> what I'm starting to see now is with so many people being in zoom is we're starting to, and I will put some kind of language around this for officializing it around the team, but it's starting to kind of zag again where it's like, Hey, like, I've been on Zoom all day. Do you just want to do a phone call? And we can both get up and walk around <laughs> giving people permission to be off of Zoom. Because one of the things that I'm noticing, and it wasn't until um, I, was, I was talking to, actually, my mom's a social worker. And so she was like, you know, all of her work was in person originally. And she was like, the biggest difference I've noticed in meetings is she was like, I feel like, you know, in a Zoom, it feels like I've, everyone's eyes are always on you. So you've always got to be like, posture up, like you've got to be on. And she's like, but in the truth, like sometimes someone else is speaking and you can take a minute and you can slouch for a second. And sometimes that's all it takes. But if you're just on all day, like it can be really draining. And so giving people that permission to be like, hey, you don't have to be on. You don't have to be presenting for me. Like, let's go ahead and like just do audio so you can just sit however you want to sit and be comfortable for a few minutes is also kind of a nice balance. So figuring out what's most appropriate because there's so many good signals you get from being able to obviously being in person, but if you can't being able to see someone's facial expressions and body language, but I'm finding that there's a place to, you know, zag away from that too and give people permission to, to relax a little bit. I'll actually double down on what you said. This video is actually a very intense medium. Okay. Because you're really, you're really up in someone's face, right? Like here I am, I'm, look, <laughs> I'm looking at you and you can see my every expression. You can see my every tell. You can see if I slept last night, you can see everything, <laughs> right? Because if you think about like a lunch with someone, um, all right, so let's say you and me go to lunch and we go to our favorite place, the Silver Diner. Does everyone remember the Silver Diner? They're still open for takeout. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um and we go and we sit down and, you know, then maybe I need to get up and go to the restroom and then the waiter comes and then, you know, we get to look at our, I, I, um, 
what questions soon? Okay. Oh, that was you're okay. Soliciting. Yeah. All right, I just just having to read real quick. And, you know, <laughs> and, and then we're looking at the menu. We're both looking down at the menu, and and um, we chit chat a little bit, and then we do connect, and we do talk, and we do have ideas, and we do converse. But then the waiter comes back and interrupts. So just imagine that flow of a meal with the interruptions, and that's true for any conversation and any coffee and any any place you're sitting down with people. But the video doesn't really give you the option for that. You gotta be here, it's like you said, front, center, you can see what the person's doing, you can see them nodding their heads, you can see everything that's going on, especially if you're one of these people who really likes to perceive this kind of thing about others. And so it is incredibly exhausting. And if you do it all day long, especially, and we have done the exact same thing that you said, for people that I see a lot and that I interact with a lot, by all means, call me on the phone. We're going for a walk around the block. Or, right. uh, or, or you know what? I'm on in my basement on the elliptical and that's what that beeping noise is. <laughs> <laughs> right? But on the flip side, you can also build relationships over video much faster. Yeah. There's, I mean, there's an amount of, you know, while it is a very intense, there's a lot of connectivity you can have just through, you know, video. There was, um, I can't remember the artist's name. Do you remember who did uh, The Artist is Present? No. Her whole exhibit was she, it was a room in New York and she would sit on one side of it and you would come sit down on the other and no one would speak. She would just basically look into your eyes and be fully present for like a full hour. I think it was a full hour, it was 15 minutes or an hour. And people would come out like crying and like just existing and being fully present in a moment. There's a lot there. And that doesn't usually happen whenever you're in person, but whenever you're connecting this way, like you are forced to kind of be like you said, head on, there's very minimal interruption. A lot can happen in a much smaller amount of time. I cannot deal with that for more than 60 seconds. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> <laughs> we did. I know my attention span is shot because we built this little bot, which I think half the team might appreciate and the other half is annoyed by, but it just, it, because we stare at screens all day, it just gives you like a little like, Hey, don't forget to refill your water bottle or something. Yeah. And at one point it was like, Hey, here's a three minute, like micro meditation you might want to try out. And I was like, you know what? I've been on calls all day. Like a little micro meditation sounds good. So I hit play on it and it's a YouTube video. That's three minutes and 10 seconds. And I like close my eyes and it's like, all right. And I was like, oh, it's clearly been like five minutes. I open my eyes and I'm like 18 seconds into this meditation. And I was oh like, God. oh no, <laughs> <laughs> I'm shot. I've got to get some practice. But um, no, I think uh, considering the time, um, let's talk a little bit about um, some just best practices some tips I think people can take away. Um, Allard definitely will answer your question about uh, what kind of equipment we use and what kind of equipment we might recommend. Um, and then another thing that I think is an important note, and you touched on it very early, which was like the next tail push to talk is understanding where and where not to apply friction to a process. Because a lot of the tools you can add in now are very frictionless. And that was the nice thing about next is it was like very friction free. You can push, you can talk to anybody on the team. Whereas if you had to like jump in and like dial somebody, wait for them to answer, like that's so much friction for what was such a short amount of communication that was needed. It wasn't worth it. Right. Um, and what we're finding is that while all these tools enable you to have these like almost frictionless environments, that friction plays a role. Like sometimes you don't want people just to be like brain dumping into Slack and notifying everybody of what they're thinking until that's, you know, that is fully baked. And so think about the practical applications of friction and where it makes sense to have either hard coded things within these systems that you could do to kind of help prevent that and make things a little bit more challenging and where you want them to be a little bit more fluid and a little bit more easy because people are going to for most communications naturally take the path of least resistance. So sometimes it makes sense to be really mindful about how you want the team to communicate to set some of those protocols in place. That is a very interesting topic. One for a, another webinar we'll dive into. Oh, possibly, yeah. You got my brain thinking on that. It's like, where is friction appropriate? You know, when we run into that a lot um, in design, because, you know, it used to be like websites where like, we want to make sure the form is as easy as possible to fill out. So everyone fills it out. Right. And you can make some things so easy to fill out that they start filling it out wrong. So then we started adding in like address standardization. Mm -hmm. And then we started realizing like, 
hey, some of these things we want to add some friction to. Like one of our clients is, uh, is Aerolab up in Maryland and they build these gigantic wind tunnels. They, if anyone's ever done like the iFly, like they build the- Oh yeah, fun. I've done that. I, we did that as our whole company. It's one of our culture things. So. Oh, nice. It's so much fun. I loved it. Really um, <laughs> but they build those things. And so some people, you know, they'd be contacting them from across the world and the forms were kind of so easy that they'd miss enter specs. And so we're like, oh, we need to add some friction here to make sure the specs are right. Add a little bit of cognitive friction. And that applies, I think, in any way that you're using software. And I think it applies culturally. So I think there's a lot of interesting things to, to unpack there. Yeah, that is very interesting. Cool. Well, um, let's go ahead and do a quick couple minutes on uh, equipment. And then uh, let's talk about maybe just a couple platforms or tips people can use. And then we'll wrap it up. I love talking about equipment. I could do that all day. What equipment are you using? <laughs> All right. Uh, so Allard, so I've got a, uh, I like the road podcast. Um, so I've got, this is a road, road podcaster, Mike. Um, it comes with an arm. It's like 120 bucks or something off Amazon. Uh, it's super useful. Um, I have a 1080p uh, Logitech webcam, which may be too high resolution. Sometimes I see myself and I'm like, mm, maybe I should blur it out a little bit. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but uh, you, those could, are the things you, could, you could just get old and then not wear your glasses. It works just the same. Oh, this is, this is yeah. good. I like fine. it. You're totally right. fine. You look totally blurry to me. I'm all right. The natural blur is coming for me. It's in my future. So we're good to go there. So uh, that's what I like. It's a USB mic. You don't have to worry about condenser. The one thing I would make people aware of is uh, if you're using it primarily for Zoom calls, conference calls, um, and you're the only one in your office, or the only one going to be using it, get a directional microphone. We get some people that are like, oh, cool. Like that seems like a neat one. And it's like maybe an omnidirectional condenser mic or something. Mm -hmm. And that's cool, but it's meant to pick up sound within a room. So if you've got six people around a table and you need to speak into a mic, that's great. But if you are the only one using it, it's going to pick up every bit of background noise. It's going to pick up your HVAC. It's going to pick all those things up and funnel into the call. And it's just going to sound, you know, really kind of rattly and nasty. So get the right mic uh, for your specific situation. We, we stumbled across something very interesting. I'm going to pick it up and show it to you in the camera. Mm. This, is, this is a Jabra. Oh. A, a Jabra Speak 710. And um, I really like it because it's, like a, it's a portable conference uh, speakerphone. But it has like a little stand on the end. If you could see the stand. Oh, so you can kind of get some directionality into it. Yeah, so you can stand it up. So I've got it uh, stood up. Um, you still hear me okay? I messed yeah. up. Is that the one you're speaking into right now? Yeah, that's actually what I'm speaking into right now. And, um, and it does a great, as far as I can tell from what people have been telling me, it does a great job of picking up my voice. And it does a great job of acting as a, um, and it has a, you know, a rechargeable battery on the inside. So it, it, it doesn't need to be plugged in. Nice. Uh, you could like actually just access it via Bluetooth. So you can access it with your cell phone too. And uh, it just does a wonderful job of being a conference phone, like a speaker phone, and also of being a microphone for these uh, Zoom calls. And it has the side effect of uh, being a great, a surprisingly great speaker. Nice. And so you can actually uh, listen to music. It sounds half decent. Um, <laughs> Well, that's kind of, you know, it depends on your laptop. You may not have decent speakers, you know. For so sure, it's, yeah. It's around 200 and some dollars, so it's not cheap, but it is a microphone and a speaker. If you get two of them, you can set them both up on both sides of your laptop. This is for rich people. I can't do this. <laughs> <laughs> and it'll actually provide stereo sound. It'll sync up to stereo? Nice. Sync up to stereo. And you, if you flatten them out and set them on the sides of like on a different parts of a long conference table, they'll actually link up and provide you one conference uh, type of type of Oh, thing. nice. Yeah. That's pretty great. And uh, uh, for those, yeah, watching or listening, we'll also, um, we'll grab the link for that and, you know, just throw it in the notes. So if anyone wants to go check that out, they can. I'll throw in the notes for the, the stuff we use on our side too. Yeah. And I'm using the same camera you're using. I absolutely love these Logitech, um, cameras they actually have very good microphones on the cameras believe they do it. yeah the, the 900 series are really easy and, and nice to work with and they plug in they give good good um, viewing much of your resolution in zoom is actually based upon the the zoom settings your pipe right like how it determines your, your internet setting your or pipe, and there's also like if you're in the corporate accounts you can go in and there are settings to go to high def, which is 720p, or the full 1080p 
and it'll actually record in those too if you want to be recording. So that's that's nice. Cool. Yeah. Good deal. Let's go. We talk about equipment. Have any other good equipment that I can show off? That's uh, I love the the road stuff. I've also got the Rose. Rose is a phenomenal microphone. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's. I mean, we've got. Even if you're using it for different purposes, you know, we've got boom mics and stuff that we'll do. So if we want to shoot something on a client location, you know, just real quick and make sure you get good audio without having to do, you know, lav mics and mic everyone up and everything. Mm -hmm. You just turn this on, you can shoot it. It's got pretty good um, background cancellation. And then if you just add a filter on in post, it's, you know, pretty good, which you've got to do if you're going to cut off even the beginning and end anyway. So it works out pretty well. Right. And then looks like Allard mentioned uh, crisp.ai, which I hadn't heard of. So I'll have to check that out. What is that? Noise canceling platform, it looks like. And Allard, if you want to say anything else about it, feel free to throw it in there. Cool. All right. Well, with our last couple moments, are there any other, you know, real quick takeaway, like, hey, here's a platform worth checking out, or here's something you think is a, you know, kind of a can't lose proposition for people to look into as far as, you know, working remotely or company culture? Wait, I'm sorry. Was that for me? I was reading about the Brio. I was going to say I have one of those too. <laughs> oh, all right. Uh, yes, it was for you. Uh, if you'd like, I'll hey, go first. Sorry. No, no. Uh, go first and then let me, let me, uh, I, by the way, I have a Brio too and it's okay. I, I mean, it's fine. It's better. It's a little bit better than this other one, but I don't think it's worth the money. Good deal. So, okay. Sorry. Go ahead. Nice. Not at all. Um, so in terms of things that I think are worth checking out, uh, two platforms that I really like, one buttons on to Slack. It's called SUP the S apostrophe UP bot. Mm -hmm. All it does is it grabs three of your team members at random and says like, Hey, you guys should spend 20 minutes on the calendar to hang out and helps facilitate that calendar. Brilliant. The nice thing about it is I find if you just do one-on-one -on -one conversations, you kind of fall into the same patterns. Mm -hmm. Having a third person to kind of mix up the dynamic means it's kind of a different, interesting conversation every time. Mm -hmm. And that's been a really nice way just for people to catch up, whether it's over tea, over coffee, over a beer, whatever. Um, the other one that I really like and we're a big fan of is Office Vibe. So I know there's also Tiny Pulse and I think 15.5, but Office Vibe, what it does is you can bolt it into Slack or do it be email. And every two weeks is the way we have it set up. It'll ask your team members 10 questions about how they feel about relationships with peers, their workload, compensation, time off, all of those different things to kind of get a gauge on how the team is feeling in terms of your overall culture. And it's also really good because it's helped us catch things that we didn't think were issues and start talking about them and bring them into our collective consciousness before we would have otherwise probably had, you know, real lasting consequences as a result of that stuff. So those are two things that I think are really useful for people. No, those are excellent. Yeah, those are excellent add-ons. Um, I would, uh, I would throw in the two, two things uh, real quick. One is that um, Slack, especially, um, the larger versions of Slack has a feature called breakout rooms. And if you're bringing together a whole bunch of people and you got a huge tic-tac-toe board, connect four, connect 10, um, <clears throat> you can actually uh, set up these uh, breakout rooms and you can pre-assign people to the breakout rooms, like three people, four people, um, or you can make it random. Or something that uh, we've seen done is uh, you can set anyone up, um, you can set everybody up as a co-host Yep. And they can just bounce around to the different breakout rooms. So, yes. it's, so you're starting to get into a scenario where people have a lot of control over who they're hanging out with. And so that's also a good, uh, um, it's not like, I mean, it's not quite as, it, it's a bit more formalized than SUP, right? Where, you, where it says, hey, you guys should hang out for a little bit. This is like, you would have to have like an all company meeting or something and then split people into breakout rooms. But I think it's also a really valuable thing. Um, and the second tip, we did not cover this at all, but I would feel remiss if I didn't say something, <laughs> is that security is an important factor sure. for um, working at home. And for, especially for those of us who have been in an office and we spent a lot of time securing our offices and our office networks, and all of a sudden we're all at home all the time using personal networks and, and consumer grade equipment yeah. Um, there have been monster upticks in the security threats out there recently because of the pandemic. And so I would just sort of put a bug in your ear and um, shamelessly plug all the resources that I've put on our website, which is optimalnetworks.com slash security. Go take a look at them. There's some webinars and some documents and some 
articles and blogs, and I don't know what not, but optimalnetworks.com slash security. And because uh, I know we're running out of time here, but I really did just want to bring up security as a key factor for working at home also. Yeah, I mean, that's a big one. That's a whole topic for a whole nother uh, webinar potentially. Because um, oh, we've seen the same thing. I mean, people trying to, you know, access and hack sites. And I mean, you know, idle hands are the devil's playthings. And there's a yeah. lot of idle hands right now. So this is uh, optimalnetworks.com slash security. So there's a lot of resources you can check out here if you want to go ahead and check that out. And if you want to follow Hainan in terms of social media, uh, these are the places you can find them. So Optimal Networks on just about everything, but on LinkedIn, you know, throwing some hype. Or, or follow me on LinkedIn. Or I follow like Hainan himself, yeah. H. Londa. And uh, of course, uh, next uh, webinar, I think is coming up, uh, you know, here in June is going to be uh, with our dear friend, Kevin Manny. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be, he's the author of Play Bigger. Uh, so he talks about how a lot of organizations are really kind of taking over in terms of a winner take all economy. And mm -hmm. so how do you take what feels like a routine business um, that may not you know, be able to approach these kind of exponential levels of growth and, you know, play bigger. Uh, so we're going to be talking a little bit about how you can take whatever your category might be and magnifying that. If that's something you guys are interested in, uh, you can go to yokoceo.com slash webinar to register for that one. And uh, if you uh, joined us for this one live, we'll go ahead and send you a follow up uh, with an email in case that's something you're interested in. Um, otherwise, I think that's about it. We will see you guys next time. I just want to say thank you again, Hainan, for joining us and sharing some tips about remote work and culture. And thank you, Chris. It was a lot of fun. Thanks awesome. for having me. <laughs> All right. And then uh, let's see. I think we covered. Uh, Lauren, is there any questions or anything that made through that we should wrap up with? Or are we good to go? Nope. That sounds good. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. If you have any other questions or uh, anything you'd like Hainan and I to follow up with, you're welcome to answer or ask via email. And uh, we'll certainly follow up with you guys. Thank you for attending. And we'll talk to you all soon. Yeah. Take care, everyone.